while we were talking, I, I was looking at Twitter, and uh, Tamir Rice uh, was trending. Allegedly, what happened was police were called uh, about a guy with a gun pointing it at people, and the dispatcher told, uh, you know, the, the person calling told the dispatcher that the gun was probably fake. Uh, this was not relayed to the responding officer, uh, the responding officers. So they, basically the officers pulled up and immediately killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice uh, as soon as they got out of their car. Vlad, let me ask you, who, who's, whose communities do these, these incidents primarily happen in? Uh, seems like the poor communities. Usually a poor community, and typically a black or Latino community, right? Mm -hmm. My question is, for you is, why do you think that police, or my question maybe for the audience too, is why do you think police can do that there, or do that there? Is, why don't they do that in rich neighborhoods? Is it because they think they can't get away with it? Is it because that, that white life is worth more than black life? Rich life is worth more than poor life. What is it? I think, though, that when you ask yourself questions like that, even if you're a skeptic, even if you're a person that thinks Darren Wilson is right, you don't want to ask yourself questions like that because you're going to end up getting answers that don't fit with your narrative of the world and society. I think it's a pretty fair, it's a pretty fair you know, statement to say if you shoot a rich person, there's probably going to be greater repercussions than if you shoot a poor person. So is justice in America only for rich people then, you know? Is it, because obviously there, there's, a, there's a huge divide um, in how people think the police perceive um, so-called minorities, even though we're a majority in the world. We've just been trained to think we're a minority to politically minimalize us. But I think that it, if we consider that, um, then we have to wonder um, not just about that specific scenario, but all of them in general. Like, for example, um, I was part of a uh, teaching program um, up, in, uh, up in the Bronx at Horizons. And what I saw was a lot of kids that may have been there for one crime or another, but all of them, they weren't stupid. They were really smart, smart kids. And the reason that they were in there and other children weren't had nothing to do with their guilt, Vlad. It was just that their parents don't have five or ten thousand dollars of disposable income to pay for bail. Like kids is just sitting in there on like a hundred thousand or fifty thousand bail, and their parents just you know they they're on Section Eight, some of them, or or, or and the rent is like a hundred and seventy five dollars a week a month. So it's like, you know, I gotta save up now a year's worth of rent, you know, because I'm barely scraping by in one of the most expensive cities in the world, you know and I can't get my child out of prison. And that's unfortunately a, a horrific truth about the justice system, that it's, it's built and it's structured for specific people. You know, there's been a quote that I've seen circulating around uh, the internet. It's from W.B. E.B. Dubois about how this system wasn't designed to protect certain people. Um, that may be fundamentally true in the advent of how America was structured, but now we're in an era where we're demanding what you wrote down on paper to be legitimized. You know, you can't just have it however you want to, you know. And I remind people that when they tell their story, they're only telling half of the story or a third of the story, their perception of the story. You know, I, I get into arguments with people that will be like, you know, these immigrants, you know, my grandmother came through Ellis Island and I'm like, yeah, and then she married your illegal immigrant grandpa who came from somewhere else. Don't play with me. Don't toy with me. You, every, everyone didn't come here legally from Europe. People, didn't, people weren't all rich when they came here and they were white. You know? The projects were full of Italian and Jewish people once, Vlad. You know, I, 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 I remind people, we all had these things. When we look at the negative things that, was say, that they say about, about, uh, about immigrants, you can find the exact same things that they say about Greek about Jewish people, about Eastern European people during, during the early uh, 1900s when people came here, about the jobs they shouldn't have because of how untrustworthy they are. All these negative racial stereotypes or religious stereotypes, these horrible 
uh, uh, persecutions of people based on their ethnic background. This is nothing new to America. This has always happened. I think it's just that there's been a subsection of white immigrants that have come here to America and forgotten that. You've forgotten that people treated you like shit. You forgot that they told you, no dogs, none of you. You forgot that they didn't think that you were good enough to be like them. But the difference is that, you know, at some point, Vlad, th th there wasn't just a, a class component, but there was a racial component mixed into it. Because people didn't come here and just apply for citizenship, Vlad. They came here and applied for whiteness. That's a reality. That's a truth. And I think that, you know, what, what people don't, tend to look at or don't tend to realize is that it's not just about one narrative. It's not just about, you know, something that started a week ago where we just popped up in a poor neighborhood with no respect for anything, you know, that, that, that black and Latino people created the issues that we have with police officers. I mean, that's just fundamentally not true. That's patently false. Um, I think that there's there's been hardly any training that people receive to deal with these communities. Like you, you're supposed to take care of people. How can you take care of people and help people if you have absolute contempt for them? If you don't see them as human beings? If, if you know, you say, and then you, people always hide behind a joke. You know what I mean? Because they don't want to face the fact that what they're saying may be really racist or really rude, you know? But what about that is funny? You know what I mean? I got into an argument with a cop one time. He made a racial joke and I said, yo man, that's not funny. He goes, oh, it's just a joke. I said, what if I made a joke about all your friends that died on 9-11? Would that be funny? No, I wouldn't make that joke because that's not the person I am. But I guess that's the motherfucker you are. And the dude in me, really, I think he was about to arrest me because we, we really got... I mean, I, I tell you right now, I think with, with, when you argue with them, I just don't curse. I try not to curse, but I just say whatever I need to. I, I've gotten to the point where it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to arrest me for speaking? I'm not going to shut up no more. I, I, I'm, I'm done trying to placate or be nice to people. I'm telling them exactly how I feel and exactly how it is. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I just always tell people, don't pop shit when you're riding dirty. You know, that's the number one rule of the day. If you're going to sit there and, and say, oh, you know, I'm standing up for human rights, for civil rights, you know what I mean? And then you got... You know, a pound of molly on you, it's God knows what, packets of molly on you, a pound of weed in the trunk, and then there's somebody's hand in the glove compartment. You know, you should probably shut the fuck up and clean your house up before you invite people over to tell them your political opinion. You know, I, I think that, that that's dangerous. You know, you don't want to expose yourself. You know, and I, 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 I definitely want to send a very big shout out, not just to the people uh, in Ferguson that are protesting, but the people around the country, you know, wherever they are, in Chicago, in New York, in Atlanta, um, down in Florida. I know people are out in the Midwest, um, West Coast, you know, and then all around the world. We, we all appreciate that support and we think that that's, that's a necessity, especially now, to keep more young people connected so that we know that this is a struggle that represents all of us.